Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to the School of Nursing in Midifree. Um, my name is Carol King. I'm a lecturer here in the school and I head up the Civic Engagement Programme. And this programme provides seven lectures throughout the year. And this is the second in the series for this year. In terms of safety, there's an exit at the back door there and the door you came in here. And in the event of an alarm going off, if you just follow us. You can follow me because I'll be the first one to leave the building. If you just run after me. I would ask you to put your phones on mute, please, during the lecture. And we're going to start the lecture now and end around six. Yeah, yeah? OK. And then we'll have questions afterwards. So I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Tomás Irish, who's the Associate Director of the Centre for War Studies here in Trinity College, Dublin. And he's going to discuss TCD's experience in the First World War when over 3,000 students, staff and alumni of the college enlisted in the British Armed Forces and ended up serving in various theatres of war across Europe and the world. He's going to share with us his recent research and he is due to publish a book next year, I think, on these experiences. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome, please, to Dr. Tomás Irish. Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak, first of all. Um, I want to start um, with this guy who's called John Pendleton Mahaffey and talk about things that we think we know about Trinity in the First World War, the things that are kind of have resonated um, over the years. In October 1914, the College Gaelic Society organized an event in Trinity to mark the centenary of the birth of Thomas Davis, an Irish nationalist who was also an, an alumnus of the college. For this event, they invited W.B. Yeats they invited um, Thomas Kettle, and they also invited uh, Patrick Pierce to speak. Now, John Penton Mahaffey became provost of the college um, at the end of 1914, and he was invited to take the chair for this meeting. But after the outbreak of the First World War, Pierce began agitating against enlistment in the British Army. And when he heard about this, Mahaffey refused to allow the meeting to take place. He wrote to the society saying that a man called Pierce, quote unquote, was not welcome at Trinity College Dublin specifying that his anti-recruitment views just weren't palatable. Well, the society responded by writing back and forth to Mahaffey, seeing if they could change his mind, and when they discovered they couldn't, they decided to do what any good society would do. They released the correspondence to the press. So you see it all appeared in the press um, at the end of October, start of November. Um, at that point, college decided to suppress the society outright. So the society ceased to be but the meeting still went ahead on the 20th of November, 1914. So exactly um, one week ago, 100 years ago, if that makes sense. Um, and it became a very famous meeting. Um, W.B. Yeats spoke, he condemned Mahaffey for having broken what he called, quote, the truce of the muses. But in a sense, um, this story has been repeated much, a lot over the years, especially after the 1916 Rising. But we don't know a huge amount, amount about Trinity's experience of war beyond it. Why was the college so committed to the war? Why were they so afraid of anti-war views being expressed in the walls of the college? And so on. But before I get into this, I want to just do a little bit of contextual um, background about Trinity and Ireland. Trinity College Dublin has a long and complex relationship with Ireland. It was founded in 1592 to enforce the Elizabethan Reformation in Ireland. And the university came to take on an important symbolic value as a symbol of Protestant ascendancy in Ireland thereafter. It didn't admit Catholics until 1793, and thereafter it still remained overwhelmingly Protestant. It was a middle class institution whose primary value was in training young men for professional careers in medicine, law, the clergy, engineering, and frequently this took them to far-flung corners of the British Empire. <coughs> the college was a conservative and establishment institution and more or less was populated by a conservative, conservative and establishment staff and student body. As the 19th century turned to the 20th, political and cultural nationalism began to grow in force in Ireland and Trinity came to take on um, an even stronger symbolic value in this context and was represented as an institution that was not only resistant to cultural nationalism, but actively embodied all that was wrong with, with the union between Britain and Ireland. 
the college became a lightning rod for criticisms emanating from the emerging, emerging nationalist body. It was generally represented as Protestant, as Unionist, as anti-Irish, and as being closed to the wider world, and by extension, closed to emerging nationalist Ireland, which in turn was represented as Catholic and desirous of greater autonomy from Britain, and energized by a revival of interest in its native language and indigenous culture. So in the decades of cultural awakening and political intensification leading to 1912, Trinity came to act as a symbol in, the, in this battle, and especially in nationalist periodicals. Um, to give an example, the leader, which is an especially vituperative um, nationalist newspaper, would frequently refer to Trinity as either, quote, the parochial university, the robber university, or more frequently, England's faithful garrison. Trinity had a symbolic importance, but it also had a political importance. Its provost, or the head of the university, was appointed by the British government, and depending on the political context, was appointed for political reasons. Also, Trinity, like its sister universities of Oxford and Cambridge, had parliamentary representation in Westminster. Its graduates elected two representatives, um, and in the context of the outbreak of the First World War, these men were significant. Trinity's two MPs in 1914 were the Unionist James Campbell and the man you can see over my shoulder, Edward Carson. The latter, famous as the leader of the Ulster Unionist faction and a greatly influential figure in the British Conservative movement. He was also the man who had made the threat of partition of Ulster an armed reality from 1912. However, the university was, was increasingly divided on political issues. In October 1912, Campbell, the junior member of parliament, had proposed an amendment to the Home Rule Bill, which is making its way through the House of Commons. And this amendment proposed that Trinity would be excluded from the legislation outright. In other words, it would just be a little island which was governed from Westminster in the centre of Dublin, while the rest of Ireland was granted um, um, a degree of self-rule across the road in College Green. The amendment, as you can imagine, caused ructions amongst the university body of staff and students and was overruled. Um, and, but this controversy over, controversy over the amendment only served to sense this idea that Trinity was somewhat disconnected from the rest of Ireland. And this cartoon shows what a nationalist periodical represented Trinity as in 1912. That's the provost, Anthony Trail, on the left, who's sort of um, holding the ascendancy sword. And to, our, to his right, as we look, are Carson and Campbell. So in the First World War, just over 3,000 undergraduates, graduates, and staff members served. Most of these were volunteers. The mechanism through which students could gain commissions in the army was the Officer Training Corps. Officer Training Corps were set up at schools and universities across Britain from 1907 as part of a program of army reforms. The OTCs gave students specialized military training, allowing them to quickly gain commissions in the army in the event of war. The OTCs also became popular for their own sakes. They were sociable and provided students with another outlet from purely academic concerns. Trinity's Officer Training Corps was set up in 1910. They established a parade ground on the east end of college, which is where the, the Hamilton building now stands, just behind Westland Row, um, and they drilled there daily. At its peak in the years before the First World War, the OTC had around 400 members, which amounts to around one third of the overall student population in, the, in that period. So as such, I think we can say that student life was significantly militarized when war broke out. When the war did break out, men flocked to the OTC, both from inside and outside of Trinity, recognizing that it would provide a quick means of getting a commission in the army. And it's important just to note that there were people from outside college joining via the OTC and 450 men with no connection to the university gained commissions in that way. However, the outbreak of war posed difficult questions for universities across Europe. Simply put, what should they be doing in wartime? In Britain, the letters pages of the newspapers were soon alive with talk of universities and their wartime obligations. Some um, authors writing to, to the newspapers suggested that universities should be closed altogether and students should be forced to enlist in the armies. This provoked a very strong reaction from university and college heads in the letters pages of the Times. 
they argued forcefully that by supplying officers, men who were supposedly imbued with greater moral and intellectual qualities than those in the rank and file, universities would have a very important wartime function. Following strident letters from, their, from his counterparts at Oxford and Cambridge, um, Mahaffey, who I mentioned a little earlier, who was vice provost of the college at that point, wrote to the Times in late September 1914 to make the same argument. And he noted the enthusiasm of Trinity men enlisting in the armed forces, adding, quote, so far as we can speak for the loyalty of Ireland, we are speaking with no uncertain sound. The majority of Trinity enlistment took place early in the war. 224 men, or around 7% of the overall total, volunteered for service in August 1914 alone. By the end of 1914, this figure was 725, or around a quarter of the overall figure for the war, and a further 785 men would enlist in 1915 before enlistment figures dropped off significantly. Broadly speaking, Trinity recruitment trends overlap with that of Ireland more generally. Conscription, however, was never enforced in Ireland, and all men who enlisted in the armed forces did so as volunteers. While there's no overwhelming single reason for enlistment, a number of common threads informed the, de the decision of Trinity men to do so. And while there were often reasons which were specific to the college which impelled men to enlist, often the reasons were no, diff no different to those of other Irish men, irrespective of class, creed, or political views, or of young men across Europe and the world. To start, um, Trinity's connection to the British Empire is very important. As I mentioned earlier, the college had a long connection to the empire through things like the Indian Civil Service, the Engineering School, the Medicine School, and the Church of Ireland, which all provided routes to a profession. And many in the university saw support for the war as a continuation of this strong imperial association. Imperial affinity linked political ideologies, professional aspirations, and the social identity of students. And this was a common theme in universities in the British Empire. For example, in the engineering school, 68 of 78 students in the class of 1913 enlisted in the armed forces, showing the strong connection. I'm thankful to Tom Turpin for that um, piece of information. But I think this only tells part of the story. A lot of historians will claim as well that many Irishmen enlisted due to the big political ideas of the war. Superfi superficially conflicting political aspirations, such as unionism, um, both in Ulster and in, in the south of Ireland, and nationalism, as embodied by John Redmond, found common cause in support for the war. In each instance, it was presented as an opportunity to prove the loyalty of the respective cause to Westminster in the hope of gaining favor in return. And the image which you see here is another iconic representation of Carson and Redmond, the two opposed leaders prior to 1914, making common cause against the backdrop of the war. Trinity was traditionally a strongly unionist institution, and it's true that many felt support for the war effort was in the best interests of maintaining the union between Ireland and Britain. Similarly, the growing number of home rulers amongst the student body felt that support for the war would be a show of goodwill towards the British government. Home rule was placed on the statute books in September 1914 to become law once the war ended. The events of 1914 presented a watershed moment where cooperation replaced antagonism and previously suspicious um, factions were united in the common cause of the war. And you can see this blurring of political lines in Trinity as well. To give an example, um, a man called P.L. Dickinson en enlisted with a number of Trinity men, including Ernest Julian, who is the Reed Professor of Law, in September 1914, just after John Redmond's famous speech at Woodenbridge, County Wicklow. Dickinson wrote of him and his friends that, quote, numbers of Dublin men like myself thought, well, I don't belong to his party, but he has done the big thing. Let us shake hands and we will join up in the Irish volunteers pledged by John Redmond to the cause of the Allies. Another um, to enlist through the College OTC called Noel Drury noted the unusual change which came over this sense, or which came about as a result of this sense of shared purpose amongst home rulers and unionists in the spring of 1915. And he wrote, quote, what a change the war has brought over things to be sure. If anyone had told me a year ago that I would have marched to a Roman Catholic chapel to a rebel tune, I would have said they were potty to say the least of it. 
However, enlistment cannot be reduced to political beliefs alone. Striking, too, was the group dynamic, a phenomenon which can be seen at schools and universities, clubs, and workplaces in societies where conscription was not enforced. This spoke to the intimate bonds of loyalty which formed in the course of a university education, where adolescents became men, spent long hours living, studying, playing sport, and socializing together. And you see this quite a lot in accounts of the period. One undergraduate um, by the name of Walter Starkey recalled that, quote, I followed the example of my college friends and went to a recruiting depot to offer my services, noting that he felt a sense of, quote, moral obligation. Another undergraduate by the name of Frank Laird described himself as, quote, a man of peace, but fretted over, quote, the awkward question of how my friends would regard me afterwards if they found me still at home when the war was over. An article in the student newspaper from November 1914 stated, stated that, quote, there are still some Trinity men who have not come forward. This is no time for moralizing or for gloomy thoughts. So in total for the war period, just over 15% of Trinity men who enlisted in the armed forces would die. And this is a proportion in line with other universities in Britain, which was higher than the general death rate in the British Army. In total, 471 men would die um, in the war, and that's a figure that includes staff, students, and alumni. So for a community that was quite intimate, it felt, it felt the full impact of a global war. Trinity students and graduates died in diverse arenas such as Mesopotamia, German East Africa, West Africa, Egypt, Germany, and Italy, as well as on the better known Western Front. Indeed, there were only three months in the entire conflict where a Trinity man or woman did not lose their life in some sort of war service. And those were August 1914 and February and June 1918. At the same time, there were periods and months where suffering was especially um, acute to the college community. And the month of August 1915 was perhaps the darkest in the college's entire history. In that single month, at least 47 students, staff, and alumni died, the majority during the ill-fated engagement at Suvla Bay on the Gallipoli Peninsula in modern-day Turkey between the 15th and 16th of August. <laughs> Many, though not all of these men, were members of the Dublin Pals, D Company of the 7th Battalion of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. And these were men who chose not to seek a commission as an officer, but to fight alongside their friends. The Pals were formed through the efforts of F.H. Browning, a recruitment activist, a Trinity alumnus, and the president of the Irish Rugby Football Union. The terrible losses of war were experienced in different ways. Shared membership of a small community such as a college, a school, a club, or a workplace, meant that news of the death of a colleague was often cause for intense grief. For some, the grief was literally familial. The lecturer in history, Constantia Maxwell, lost her brother, Thomas, in September 1916. Similarly, the professor of chemistry, Sidney Young, lost his son, Emma Ypres, in 1915, while Trinity surgeon Sir Robert Woods saw his son die in October 1916. Mahaffey, who is now provost, fretted over the safety of his own sons, writing to inform a friend that his son, Rob, had been shot through both cheeks, had a number of teeth knocked out, and could now only speak with difficulty. Nobody was immune to the war. James Campbell, who I mentioned earlier as one of the, the university's members of parliament, fretted over the safety of his son, who was serving in the Dardanelles, and wrote to the government minister, Andrew Bonner Law, repeatedly to see if influence could be brought to bear to have his son pulled back from the fighting fronts and given a clerical job in London. He was unable to secure this, and Philip Campbell was killed um, at Beaumont Hamel in November 1916. So whatever pretensions the Trinity community may have had to be at a remove from society more generally was show, were shown not to be the case. In the war, deaths didn't distinguish in this way. So while death was experienced in familial terms, it also occasioned intellectual anxieties. Across Europe, a generation of young scholars was being wiped out, and it seemed to many that modes of thought were going with them. In a Trinity context, um, in 1915 at Suvla Bay, the Reed Professor of Law, Ernest Julian, was killed. 
Um, and that's a position that was later held by both Murray McAleese and Murray Robinson. And later in the war, weeks before the armistice, Samuel George Stewart, a precocious mathematician and fellow of the college, was also killed. So wartime losses struck at something deeper in the fabric of intellectual life. And this was a fear that knowledge itself was being irrevocably lost in the conflict. However, I don't want to overlook the college's non-academic staff either. 37 of them volunteered for war. Unlike the majority of students and alumni, these men generally served as privates in the rank and file and became ordinary soldiers. George Marsh, who was a porter and a Catholic, began working in Trinity in 1907. He had an address in the inner city, and in 1913 it was reported that he was the father of three children and had lost five since starting his term of employment in college. Marsh died of shell shock in March 1918 at the age of 37. It's interesting that the non-academic staff, so the porters, were not included in the College War Memorial when it was inaugurated in 1928, but the names were added decades later. So while the wider college community was shaken by the war, its hierarchical and elitist structures meant that some voices were not heard. However, the story of the war is not only the story of death. Trinity men who enlisted for active service had a multiplicity of experiences during the war, and after all, most of those who volunteered didn't die. To give some examples of the diverse sort of experiences in wartime, um, Barry Brown, who was a graduate of 1906 and was practicing as a solicitor in Dublin, went missing on the very first day of the Battle of the Somme on the 1st of July 1916. He was wounded and taken prisoner in Germany for a year, after which he was evacuated by the Red Cross to a hospital in Poland where he met and married a local woman. Philip Lister, another student, was taken prisoner in the Battle of Mons in August 1914 and spent the rest of the war in a prison of war camp in Germany. Henry Cruikshank, who had been wounded at Suvla Bay in August 1915, was later utilised in Egypt as a censor of soldiers' letters. And he had what he described as an intellectually stimulating war, which allowed him to travel and engage with new cultures. From 1917, he was stationed near Jerusalem with what he called, quote, a nice soft job, which allowed him to observe the local Bedouin tribes. And it would also be a mistake to assume that all of those who enlisted in the armed forces did so purely out of political convictions or out of a desire to fight. The university had two schools which produced men who could perform, perform important palliative and altruistic functions in wartime, being the divinity school and the medical school. Medical students and recent graduates were much valued for their professional and expert knowledge and desperately needed at the front. Of the 3,000 members of the college community who served in the war, 993, or almost a third, served on the medical side through the Royal Army Medical Corps. The Divinity School also played an important role in wartime. Many clergymen went to war in the expectation that it might lead to something of a religious revival. Of Trinity men who enlisted, 193 did so as army chaplains, which was a non-combatant role. Most notable amongst these was the graduate Edward Campbell, an Anglican chaplain who was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his work in turning bodies on the Somme battlefields. Army chaplains also had to perform duties such as writing to the next of kin to inform them of the death of a soldier, as well as holding voluntary services on a Sunday. However, not all clergymen opted to serve as chaplains in the army either, and some would take combatant roles. The shared references, acquaintances, and stories all born of a scholarly life in Dublin, begot intimacy and provided solace to men who found themselves in very trying circumstances hundreds of miles from home. Alumni dinners were held by soldiers in locations as disparate as Cairo, Jerusalem and Baghdad. The group identity fostered in the course of a university education was durable and meaningful, and men who found themselves at different fighting fronts were on some level seeking to keep the college community intact as best they could. So you'll see quite often in letters, people are excited to hear that there's somebody else from Trinity, even if they don't even know them nearby, so they can go and maybe share stories, or at least have some way of connecting to somebody on a level which can normalize the situation more than, that, than it otherwise might be. So if meeting fellow Trinity people at the front rendered that somewhat more normal than it otherwise was, what of the campus during the war? 
during the war, classes continued. Although while there was a, nor a desire for normality, this was rendered impossible. In 1915, an editorial for the student newspaper stated that, quote, it would appear that the activities of us students cannot continue unabated this session. The best men are away, and the hearts of the rest of us cannot be holy in our college life. The bare fact is that in so far as is possible, Trinity College has laid aside the pen for the sword. The war significantly reduced student numbers at Trinity, but the campus was not empty. The number of undergraduates on the books fell from around 1200 in 1914 um, to 721, which was its lowest point by 1918. So it, it just under halved. In early 1915, the professor of French, T.B. Rudmose Brown, reported that he had no students whatsoever for certain classes. As today, students were the lifeblood of the college, and their absence underscored the abnormality of the situation. So student societies were one of the big casualties of the war, and this shows that the policy of business as usual was a very difficult standard to meet. Many simply ceased operation during the war. Larger societies, such as the historical, found it easier to get by and continue their work, but the war frequently pervaded what they were doing and the motions which they debated were on war issues, as you might imagine. Even if you look at something like the student newspaper, um, the war pervaded that too. You can see that it was quite common to see adverts for uniforms, as you see on the left and on the right, um, the opticians of the university advertising different military um, equipment as well. So the war is pervading everything. I think the next set of images illustrates as well. On the left is a cartoon, which you see quite a lot of in the student newspaper before the outbreak of war, um, which I think captures a lot of the sense of what student life was before war broke out. It captures a sense of sort of the frivolity and what was important to students, namely <coughs> debates, sport, dances, and the like, as well as the exams you see in the top right. And what's interesting is that this um, these cartoons were written or were drawn by a man called Edwin, Edwin Lamas, who was a cousin of Sean Lamas, who served in the war himself. And then on the right, you see something that became more normal during the war. This, the idea that this space is reserved for a fit contribution, will you fill it or fill it? So the sort of the tone, even in organs like the, the student newspaper, which tried to embody this idea of continuity, the tone changed what was being represented for students and those who remained in college changed. The absence of men meant that women became much more visible in day-to-day -day life. The professor of history, Walter Allison Phillips, noted in 1915 that his history classes were reduced to, quote, four girls and a callow youth. The traditionally male-dominated student magazine began, began making appeals for female contributors. And by 1918, a movement calling for the fuller integration of women into societal culture of Trinity had emerged, as it had elsewhere. Quote, feminism has made and is making great strides in the world. The women here must only hope that Trinity will not limp too slowly behind the rest of the universe. However, within a week of this editorial in the student newspaper, um, it had been inundated with unpublished letters of complaint from fellows of the college. The reformist trail halted there, and for the most part, women would remain second-class citizens in Trinity until the late 1960s. However, I don't think you can discuss the experience of Trinity during the First World War without discussing the Easter Rising, because for many of those present, the Easter Rising was experienced as part of the war. Well, Trinity was, like the rest of the city of Dublin, caught unawares by the events of the morning of the 24th of April, 1916. The college was a virtual shell. Most people were away for the long weekend, and this compounded the college's underpopulation on account of the war. However, as word began to trickle in of a rebellion, those who were present in college, without knowing details of what was actually happening, sought to make it secure. The, ch the chief steward, a man called Joseph Marshall, immediately had the front gate locked. And almost unthinkingly, members of the college community descended upon the college on hearing news of the rising. It seems that people were instinctively drawn to the campus. One member of the OTC wrote later that, quote, he knew everybody would be wanted there. And when they got there, they found about a dozen men collected 
and at once we got our rifles and ammunition and served them out. Trinity during Easter week 1916 was a microcosm of the wider war. Those assembled in college on Easter Monday came from across Ireland, Britain and the Empire. Gerald Fitzgibbon, later a Supreme Court judge in the Irish Free State, estimated that on that day there were five Anzacs, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps members, two or three Canadians and nine South Africans, as well as men from different British regiments. These men were all on leave in Dublin and came to Trinity on hearing news of the Rising, and for them the Rising was another battle being fought in foreign surrounds. This improvised garrison, which um, got together on Easter Monday, quickly organized itself. They made preparations for an attack which they assumed would come, but it never did. The Trinity story of 1916 was initially a non-event, and this surprised almost everybody. Gerald Fitzgibbon wrote of his surprise at the course of events. He said, quote, we were lucky to have held it. I doubted if we, if we could have stuck out for 24 hours with the means at our disposal if we had been seriously attacked. And everyone assumed an attack would come and assumed that the college would be very easily taken if somebody had tried to attack because at the peak of, for the first two days there were no more than 44 people present, but it never did. But the story, the story of this so-called defensive college is only part of the story of Trinity and the Easter Rising. On the Tuesday, a small group of students, mostly women, assembled on the steps of the dining hall in the full expectation of sitting their exams. Remarkably, they'd made their way across the city to Trinity, risking sniper fire, and they did sit their exams, and they all passed, unlike most of the men who didn't. Wednesday saw the end of the duties of the, of the motley Trinity garrison, and they were relieved by troops from the Leinster Regiment who arrived with two machine guns. In addition, four ominous 18-pound field guns arrived from Athlone. So from this point, the strategic importance of Trinity became manifest. It became the hub from which the rising was suppressed, and the college was transformed into a veritable barracks for um, weeks to come. The college continued to swell with troops on Wednesday with the arrival of the 3rd Royal Irish Regiment. So Trinity's utility in this period was strategic. Its location in the heart of the city meant it could cut communications between North and South Dublin, and its size, coupled with its many empty buildings and student rooms, meant it was an ideal staging post for troops to suppress the rebellion at most locations in the city. However, there seems to have been an unspoken understanding that Trinity College, as an establishment and conservative institution, would put itself at the disposal of the British Armed Forces suppressing the Rising. In the context of the war in which the college was so deeply invested, this was understandable. However, for the war to have come literally to one's doorstep was traumatic for all those in Dublin, and the same was true um, of those in Trinity. Ernest Alton, who was a captain in the officer training corps, who was present during Easter week and was later a provost of the college, wrote shortly afterwards that, quote, the scenes unrolled themselves in memory like the mad unrealities of a nightmare. Perhaps the most evocative response to the rising was written in the students', mag in the students um, magazine's first post-rising edition. The editorial stated, quote, to be called upon to defend our university against the attack of Irishmen, to be forced in self-defense to shoot down our countrymen. These are things which even the knowledge of duty well fulfilled cannot render anything but sad and distasteful. And this set out Trinity's dilemma eloquently. In the summer of 1916, Edward Carson presented the Officer Training Corps with the Silver Cup as a permanent memorial to the part which they played in suppressing the Rising. At the same time, the Officer Training Corps made their own Silver Cups, one of which you can see here, which were presented to a number of key individuals associated with the Defence of College in Easter Week. Replicas of these were issued to at least 150 men and women. Pretty much anybody who was present during Easter Week was given a replica. And Trinity also went to great lengths to identify and track down the colonial troops who had come into college during the Monday and Tuesday. According to their records, these numbered 13 in total, with addresses in South Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And they went to great efforts to try and send these replica cups to all of those men as well. In 
the armistice which ended the First World War was signed on, 11, on the 11th of November 1918. News of its signature was no immediate cue for celebration in Trinity, for there is very little to celebrate. Some students allied with their counterparts in the College of Surgeons and staged an informal rag, commandeering cars and staging a procession where an effigy of the Kaiser, who was wrapped in a Sinn Féin flag, was drawn behind a hearse from Grafton Street to O'Connell Street. While the armistice took the men who were at the front away from immediate danger, the campus remained underpopulated and would, and would continue its wartime improvisations into 1919. And one measure of how abnormality of wartime conditions continued was brought home in the summer of 1919 um, when amongst the traditional events of Trinity Week, um, which were traditionally sporting events like cricket, um, a baseball game took place, which is a consequence of the fact that significant numbers of American soldiers were temporarily being housed in college at the time. Classes began filling up with students once more from 1919, but they were not the carefree type of the pre-war years. One contemporary described it in the following terms. Quote, Trinity College was transformed. The lecture halls were thronged with a bewildering, type of a bewildering variety of individual types. There were students in cap and gown who some months previously had been colonels, majors, captains, men limping on crutches, others minus an arm. So in a sense, even though the war was over, it was still very much palpable, it was very much present. In 1919, it was decided to build a memorial to those members of the college community who had died in the war. War memorials of this sort catered to a human need to grieve in the aftermath of the collective trauma of war. And for an intimate community, which is very much self-contained like the Trinity community, this need was pronounced. This project to build a, mo a memorial to the war, to those who died in the war, would result in what was called the Hall of Honor, which was built in conjunction with a new reading room for the library. In 1928, the Hall of Honor was opened. This cost just over 8,000 pounds and was funded entirely by subscription. And the money was quite easily raised in the aftermath of the war, reflecting, in a sense, the, very, the middle class um, composition of the Trinity community. The Hall of Honor was formally opened by the provost, E.J. Gwynn, and James Campbell, who had become ennobled as Lord Glenavy um, in 1928. There was no official representative of the government present. And in his opening address, Glenavy spoke of the marginalization of the memory of the First World War in the Irish Free State. He said, quote, there is a growing conspiracy of silence as to the deeds of our citizen soldiers by which they redeemed our empire and purchased victory at a cost in life and treasure which has brought achievement and privation to many a home. Glenavy hoped that the Hall of Honor would provide solace to the families of the dead. And war memorials are important in this way because in many instances there were no graves that people could go to to remember their sons or their husbands or their fathers who died because most of them were buried um, at the front in Belgium or France or in the Dardanelles. So war memorials are important because they provided a focus for people's grief and they're pla places where people could gather together and grieve collectively. For Glenavy, whether he found solace in the opening of the Hall of Honor is another question entirely. As I mentioned, he had been petitioning um, Andrew Boner Law in 1915 to have his son Philip pulled away from the front and given a clerical job in London. In one of those letters written in 1915 he said, quote, I shall always have it on my conscience if the boy's nerves give way and he gets killed. So while Glenavy spoke at the opening of the Hall of Honour um, in 1928 as one of the most prominent ex-unionists in the Irish Free State, he also spoke as a mourner like hundreds of others present. Following the war, like I said, it was very important that people were able to grieve together and have a sacred place to do so. So that's the function which the Hall of Honor was supposed to perform. And evidence of this comes from the correspondence received by the organizing committee from families of the dead, who were either requesting tickets to attend the opening of the memorial or ensuring that the names of their loved ones were engraved on the walls, as you see over my shoulder. It could also be seen in the extensive list of reeds laid at the opening ceremony as parents, siblings, 
spouses and friends laid wreaths for their loved ones. Constantia Maxwell, lecturer in history who I mentioned earlier, laid a wreath for her brother Thomas, while the colleagues of Samuel Stewart, the lone fellow of the college to die in the conflict, laid one in his memory. But the list was a very long one. To conclude then, Glenavy's words at the opening of the Hall of Honour showed how the memory of the First World War became contested in Ireland. The political radicalisation which followed the Easter Rising and the execution of the leaders saw a rapid rise of radical nationalism. Sinn Féin swept the board of the 1918 elections, established their own, established a doll in January 1919, and following a bloody conflict with Britain, had established a partitioned free state by 1922. The men who volunteered for active service in 1914 in the name of the British Empire, the Union, Home Rule, or maybe out of a sense of mutual loyalty and obligation to their friends, were largely overlooked, their motivations rendered taboo in the Irish Free State. And in this context, Trinity became something of a white elephant institution. It was the product and the beneficiary of the old regime, and it had become unwittingly and somewhat unwillingly part of the new one, its old political influence and sense of privilege gone. What's more, its role in suppressing the Easter Rising, viewed as the benefit of hindsight, seemed to confirm its oppositional status in Irish life. However, it was more complex than that, and I hope I've gone some way to describe the complexity of Trinity's um, experience during the First World War. So thank you for listening. They're, they're held in the College Library in the Department of Manuscripts, so if you want, okay. you, I mean, that's open to the public. You just make an appointment yep. and um, you can look at them. It's very interesting because it's, in a sense, the whole thing was improvised and people wanted to move quickly. There's a sense that you wanted to, to provide a war memorial very quickly because pe there's a, a demand for it, but to do that, it required you gathered a lot of information very, very quickly, and that was very, very difficult to do. So initially, they're trying to gather lists, comprehensive lists of who served, who died, and so on. They initially published a book in 1922, which is called The War List. That gave the figure at 454. Um, when the Hall of Honor opens, they claim 463 had died. Um, within the next couple of years, another five names are added, so it goes to 468. And then, as I mentioned a couple of decades ago, and perhaps someone can set me right on this, the three porters were added, which takes us to 471. But the point is, it's a very inexact process all along. Um, so these letters reflect that, that fact that people were families were writing and saying, Have, do you know about my son, do you know about my husband, and that sort of thing. What's the name of the collection? It would be under the, it would be the, the muniments, and it would be Hall of Honor files, I think, or reading room, to do with the reading room of the Hall of Honor. But if you email one of the archivists, they'll be able to set you on the right. Um, or I, I can give you my email afterwards. Short answer is no. Um, not that I've come across, but it's very hard. To, there's a few reasons it's very hard to find um, if it exists. One of the main reasons, which you would find, let's say, in British universities, it's easier to find anti war sentiment, but that's because conscription was introduced. So, in a sense, conscription by definition means people have to out themselves as being against the war. As long as there's no conscription, people always have to volunteer for service. So, if you don't, you're not explicitly outing yourself as being against the war. But Trinity, I mean, like I said, the student body was establishment, middle class, conservative types. There weren't many dissenters amongst them. Um, the most dissenting voices, let's say, of student bodies and uh, societies were the Gaelic Society, and they'd been shut down in 1914 when the war broke out. And beyond that, you don't see it. But like I said, it's very, you'd need to find private correspondence to get a sense of that, because the, the student newspaper and things like that are very much under the thumb of the establishment. I can think one off the top of my head, um, and it's, it's a good example because it's, it's the, um, the architect of the Hall of Honor, Thomas Manley Dean, his son was killed at Gallipoli in 1915. Um, the family architectural firm went back, I think, four generations. They designed the museum building in college, 
um, and various other very prominent um, buildings, and his son <coughs> ended the family line. So in a sense, the commission to do the Hall of Honor for him was quite personal in that way too, because he knew that the family firm and the family line wouldn't continue. But I can't speak with any, uh, I wouldn't want to make any broader generalizations on the point you're suggesting, because it's not an area which I've, or line of research I've pursued. Interesting point you raised because Trinity and Cosgrave got on pretty well. Um, both kind of flirted with one another. Trinity gave Cosgrave an honorary degree in 1926. Um, and they generally run pretty good relations also with O'Higgins. I think the, but the war was still a bit too close to the bone. What's interesting, if you can't, so the Hall of Honor is opened in 1928, so that's the front part of the building we see here. People who know the building, the back part is what's called the reading room. That was built separately, but they were sort of part of a coherent integrated plan. The reading room was opened in 1937, hence it's called the 1937 reading room. The reading room was opened by Eamon de Valera in 1937. Um, at the opening, so it's an, maybe superficially an act of conciliation between Trinity and, um, and de Valera, there's not one word is said about the First World War. So the politics of these things are very, very interesting, and the way that they're sort of massaged is very interesting. So I'd say that it was easier for all parties in 1928, probably for the college and for the free state, that there was no state representation present. Similarly, in 1937, when they opened the reading room, it probably made, it seemed practical for all parties that if de Valera were to be present, they wouldn't discuss the war. But I know anecdotally that porters and veterans showed up wearing their war medals at the ceremony, but no word was said about it. Um, so there's a brief overlap period where Trinity has two MPs in Westminster and four representatives to so the, the government of Southern, or the Parliament of Southern Ireland, which doesn't really sit, but they're given, they have four representatives there, and then they get four representatives in the Dáil when it's established in 19, when it first sits in 22. Um, Trinity has, th that's reduced to three in 1923, and then until 1936, um, or sorry, from 1937, they're given Senate representation. So they actually have TDs in the 20s and early 30s. Um, what's really, what I think is interesting about this is that when it's floated, traditionally, the representation in Westminster was always lawyers. It was always political types um, like Campbell and Carson who were sort of cut from a, who were explicitly political and from a certain background, let's say. When Trinity is given representation in the Dáil, they, there's a very deliberate, I think, recasting of the sort of people they want to fill these roles. So they get four, and they choose explicitly non-political people who represent certain um, academic or professional backgrounds. So they take one representative of the legal profession, one of the medical profession, one scientist, and one humanist. So it's kind of, in a sense, cover all the base of what the university does in terms of providing a scientific and humanistic um, education on the one hand, and a professional education with specific emphases in medicine and law on the other. So there's a very, a very um, distinct change in the type of people who are um, being sent to represent the college. On the question of whether Westminster still had influence, yes, it did. The very long and convoluted story, which I'll try my best not to get too deep into, about money the Trinity was due at the time of the change of government. All universities during the war had run up huge debts um, due to the fact they had no student income from, or sh income from student fees. Quite often the government had appropriated college buildings. They were being used for various different things, so they were in huge deficit. The, government, the British government had pretty much said after the war we'd sort all this out. So in 1920, the British government holds a royal commission and they say, well, we'll give you, I think it was something in the region of like 100,000 pounds in either recurring grants and one-off grants. The problem is they never actually paid this money before the treaty. It became a very interesting question of whether Trinity should actually get the money after the treaty had been signed. And initially, David Lloyd George says, no, it's not our problem anymore. You know, go and talk to Cosgrave. Um, and Cosgrave says, mm, no, well, you know, you've had it good for a long time. Um, you won't get, you know, we're not going to honor the promises made by the British government. What's interesting is in 1923, when the Conservatives come back to power, Andrew Bonner Law's Prime Minister, 
Trinity sees that they have an old ally because Bonner Law had been very close with Carson, so they realize they have an old ally they can call a favor on. So they go back to him and say, can you honor this? And they say, well, yes, we're obliged to honor it in the best we can. So they actually end up paying um, significant amounts of money where af <coughs> after the free state has been established. So yeah, it actually is. Those relationships can be kind of pulled in. Women did, I don't think there was huge numbers, but if you look at the war list, which was produced in 1922, there's around 20 women's names listed in it. Most of them were doctors, like you suggest. Um, but I don't think it was any huge numbers. A lot of them, a lot of the students were involved in voluntary work, voluntary aid detachments, that sort of thing. Um, Trinity, again, was kind of proud of the fact that it, it, it always looked to Oxford and Cambridge as being, these are the people who we look to. So it was proud of the fact that it had admitted women before Oxford and Cambridge in 1904. So then, as, as kind of an outgrowth of that, is they're proud of the fact that women are serving in the war. So if you look at the Hall of Honor, the list of names, there is the name of one woman listed there, which is very unusual on war memorials. Um, now, she wasn't at the front. She wasn't in any combatant role. But she was a doctor who was um, in a war hospital in London, and she died of disease in 1917. But it was deemed important to have her name put on the memorial. Um, the question of what happened to people who came back? Well, of students who came back, I mean, like I said in, in the quote at the end, I mean, people came back missing limbs, missing um, a disfigured, shell-shocked. Um, there's a famous fellow of the college, one of the three fellows of the college who served in the war. One of them was a man called Arthur Aston Luce. He lost his hair um, during the war, it fell out. So he kind of had a visual, a visual sort of manifestation of the war stayed with him throughout his, the rest of his life. Um, some people didn't come back. There was a story of a student who was serving um, at Subla Bay. He was a very, a very accomplished medical student who had interrupted his studies, and after that he became an alcoholic, never completed his studies, and that was it. So I mean, I guess there's a diverse set of potential trajectories after the war. Spread across, uh, across a number of regiments. Obviously, like I mentioned, there were quite a strong representation in the PALs and the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. Um, you'd have quite a number in the Royal Irish um, Regiment. But it depended, in a sense, on what their vocation was. So you have a lot of Royal Engineers, if they're from an engineering background. Um, Tom's a much better authority on this than I am. Um, also, those from medical background in the Royal Army Medical Corps and so on. So it kind of depended. It also depended, in a sense, if a for those who had graduated, where they were in the world. It would also dictate what regiment they would join. So for lots of people who'd found employment in the empire, if they were in Canada or Australia or wherever, that would dictate uh, maybe where they enlisted. And they re-emerged as the Thomas Davis Society in 1920, so harking back to the reason they'd been suppressed in the first place. Um, I suppose it's hard for us to relate to it now, but back then, the, society, the board of Trinity was incredibly conservative. They, they kept tabs on everything. I mean, if you had a debate with a vaguely, um, with a motion that had vague potential to cause any, ruffle any feathers whatsoever, they'd know about it and they'd clamp down. You, so the societies were, by definition, very, they kept, they towed the line, they knew how to kind of play the game. So the Thomas Davis Society, it had more radical figures in it after the war, but still within kind of you know the co the context of student societies more generally, they couldn't really express greatly radical views without being clamped down on brutally and suppressed again. So um, that it, it you know you can't you don't really see huge evidence of that. But certainly interesting people come through the Thomas Davis Society, which is suggestive of the type of things maybe they spoke about you know after events you know, over drinks or whatever, so that people who are fighting in the, in the Anglo-Irish War and so on. So it's suggestive of a certain outlook, but you don't see the direct evidence in what they're actually doing. Okay, I would like to um, ask you to give Tomás a big thank you for his sharing his... <laughs> thank you.